Lord, for this day and this opportunity that we have to hear from your word. I pray, God, that you would do the talking, Lord, and just open up our eyes to behold wondrous things from thy love. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 All right, 2 Corinthians chapter 6, if you would. Turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 6. So we call the support sermon. We're trying to just get a, a few good truths in, uh, a little more doctrinal. Uh, just be a short half an hour long teaching, or so if I can keep it that way. 2 Corinthians chapter 6. I'm talking about being faithful in fellowship. Being faithful in fellowship. Right. 2 Corinthians 6, the Bible reads in verse 1, We then as workers together with him beseech you that ye receive not the grace of God in vain, giving no offense in anything that the ministry be not blamed, but in all things approving ourselves as the ministers of God in much patience and afflictions and necessities and distresses. And it continues on there. The thing I want to talk about is that the ministry is not to be blamed within the Christian's life. Now, there's three different types of fellowship that I want to talk about. The first is the wrong fellowship, the next is the right fellowship, and the next is the righteous fellowship. The wrong fellowship begins if you read down in the Bible in verse 14. Be not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? And what communion hath light with darkness? And what concord hath Christ with Belial? Or what part hath he that believeth with an infidel? And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God, as God hath said. I will dwell in them, and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Wherefore, come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord. And touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. Now we see there that the wrong fellowship has to do with being unequally yoked together with unbelievers. And right in this context, right in the text itself, it gives us synonyms for what unequally yoked actually means. It says fellowship. It says communion. It says concord. It says part. It says agreement. And it continues on. To give us what rather the right relationship with the unbelievers is. Communion has to do with being partaker, being of one mind together. Fellowship, the same thing. There is a commonness when you are fellowship one with another. A concord or a part suggests that there is an incompletion with the individual. Not only, Until they come together, they're not the whole. An agreement, we all know that. An agreement, you are seeing eye to eye with the unbeliever and are in agreement. The Bible is very clear that we ought not to have fellowship with the unbelievers. We are not to have fellowship with those who are not believers on Jesus Christ. And the charge is, in fact, to come out from among them. We see that in verse 16 in the second half. In the first half it says, Come out from among them, in verse 17, and be ye separate, saith the Lord. In other words, we're not supposed to touch the unclean thing, the Bible is saying. We're not supposed to be partakers. We're not supposed to be Fellowship is supposed to have communion, concord, be unequally yoked together with the unbelievers. And I'm not saying that we shouldn't have any dealings with the lost of this world. Else how could we get them saved? Right? How could we how could we reach the lost and dying world without actually being partakers with them in some way, shape, or form? Yeah. But the charge is that you don't be unequally yoked. Yeah. I think what's describing there, a yoke is something that they would place on a cow's neck in order to put the load underneath the cow that it would drive, right? A yoke essentially holds down, weighs down the beast in order to drive through the field. In the same way, the Christian shouldn't have the yoke of the unbeliever shouldn't have the weight of the unbeliever weighing upon their shoulders they're not to be unequally yoked I think the description here is that hey the Christians okay to ride the cart but they're not to be the one bearing the burden uh, the the description that I would best say is that don't let the unbeliever have the upper hand well what does that mean well that means hey your unbelieving friend at work says hey you want to come out with me later uh, yeah sure what are we doing well we're going to this this restaurant, it's, it's in a bar, but there's food off to the side. Well, now you've unequally yoked yourself because you're entering into the unbeliever's domain. You are now in the weaker state there. And I think the same relationships go um, in that same manner where we're not to have the... In other words, we're not, we're not to leave ourselves in a situation where we can't cut it off. Hey, if you want to meet with an unbeliever and bring them into your house, there, there's a decision there to, hey, <laughs> remove them from it. Um, if you're at work... 
Um, you, you can remove yourself from the situation, but as soon as you get into private dealings with the unbelievers, as soon as you get into business deals and to conquer or anything like that, you've now unequally yoked. It's the wrong type of fellowship. Christians are to be in the world, but not of the world. We're supposed to be in the midst, yes, of this crooked and perverse nation, but we're to shine as lights in the world. We're supposed to be visibly different in our goings. Yes, we are to be in the world, but not of the world. Predominantly, I believe our conversation is to be as a called out congregation. What do I mean by that? I mean, your closest, most dear, as most beloved friends should be of the congregation or a congregation of the people of God. You should be friends with Christians primarily. You should give yourself spiritually to them. You should open up your heart to them. Yes, you can have friends, but unfortunately, it only goes so deep. In the lost world. The friends in this lost world only go so deep. It's a, it's a surface relationship. And if you're to go deeper, you are setting yourselves up to be held under their bondage. Water always goes to its own level, right? We all know that illustration, right? In the same way, something that is unclean, as in the unbeliever, cannot make the clean, blood-bought, washed child of the king more clean by having fellowship with him. You will always sink to their level. A, an unbeliever will always have an adverse effect on the Christians if you let them, if you let them be in that situation where you're unequally yoked with them. With them. The right type of fellowship, we just talked about the wrong type of fellowship, turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 8. 2 Corinthians chapter 8. The right kind of fellowship. 2 Corinthians 8 verse 1. Moreover, brethren, we do you to wit of the grace of God bestowed on the churches of Macedonia. How that in a great trial of affliction, the abundance of their joy and their deep poverty abounded unto the riches of their liberality. For to their power I bear record, yea, and beyond their power, their willing of themselves, praying us with much entreaty that we would receive the gift and take upon us the fellowship of the ministering to the saints. And this they did, not as we had hoped, but first gave of their own selves unto the Lord and unto us by the will of God. So we see the right kind of relationship here, I believe, is in, in the same idea of forsaking not the assembly of ourselves together. And this ministry extension of the Christian is allowing themselves to have fellowship in the ministering to the saints. Paul here is encouraging those of Macedonia who have bestowed grace, in other words, the wealth that they had, they have given uh, a blessing unto the poor saints of them own selves. Now, 2 Corinthians chapter 8 comes up, up a lot if you've ever been to like a missions conference at a great big church. This is the verse that they're going to go through. And they're going to push that idea that, that um, we need to take upon. We need to, I love when they say beyond their power in verse 3. It says, I bear record, yea, and beyond their power, to their power and beyond their power. They'll say, you know, we ought to grace give, they call it. They say, give beyond your power. But I, I, I love how that verse continues. It says, willing of themselves. And so that high pressure missions conference where they're like, give, give, give. And even uh, just last night as I was looking through my Bible, I found where I'd made one of these face promise little cards and I'd slipped it into my Bible. And it was, it was in there forever, but it happened to fall out there. And I was like, I can't believe I gave that much. And glory to God, I was able to. But I remember that situation was not one where I gave of myself. I remember that situation was, was one of great, like, uh, emotional buildup. We're gonna we're gonna play that that video where there's like the crying kid in Africa, and we're gonna say we're gonna go and reach the lost, and and I'm all emotionally built up, and then the cards come around, and we're all just like signing our lives away, and we're like, yeah, we're gonna grace give. <laughs> Willing of themselves is what the Bible teaches. I believe that yes, God will use somebody beyond their own power. He does it each and every day. But I don't believe that this should be a high pressure situation. But that was just an aside. Fellowship of the ministry to the saints, I believe, is biblical. I believe it is right. And I believe it is good. And uh, even as a church here, we were able to give to Pastor Paulus not too long ago. He had a, he had a break in happen, and, and we were able to donate money from ourselves, of ourselves, willing of ourselves, in order to help him put that window up. Hey, there's nothing wrong with it. And that is a fellowship that we ought to have with Bible believing Christians in and amongst us. We ought to. Have fellowship with people by ministering to people. And, and, and that's great and that's good. That's the right kind of fellowship. Philippians chapter 1. Philippians chapter 1. A few pages to the right. Philippians chapter 1. The fellowship of the gospel. Philippians chapter 1. Let's start in verse 3. I thank my God upon every remembrance of you. Always in every prayer of mine for you all making requests with joy. 
for your fellowship in the gospel from the first day until now. The fellowship of the gospel is a right fellowship. And I love that the Apostle Paul commends the Philippians that from the first day until now, they had fellowship in the gospel. In other words, the second day the Apostle Paul came there and preached the gospel to these people, they were like, this is the greatest thing ever. How do I do it? And the Apostle Paul was able to teach them how to win souls. And the gospel went forth in that fellowship camaraderie. And Paul, the Apostle Paul says now as he's writing miles away, as he's writing from, from far away, he, he has confidence in them and, and in his prayers towards them and an understanding that from that first day that he met them until now they are still fellowshipping in the gospel. They didn't waver on that. And that's the right kind of fellowship. As a church, especially, we ought to have fellowship with churches who have fellowship in the gospel, who are actively seeking to preach the gospel. The danger is that if a church does not have um, a proper reach into their community, if they're not properly preaching the gospel to every creature, if they're not rightly seeking the lost each and every moment that they can, if that's not a primary thing, they're in danger of losing their first love. And therefore, uh, the, God will remove that candlestick from that church. We don't want to have fellowship with a church that's going in that direction. Now, I do believe it is right for us to reach out into members that go to that church. Not to try to convince them to come over to our way. Not to try to get them to, hey, to come to our church. Just to say, hey, winning the lost is, is, is easy. Why? Not because we're so great at it, but because the gospel is so simple. Yeah. The gospel is so good. It's a free gift available to all. And all we have to do, essentially, is take that gift to the door and say, will you have it? Will you have Jesus? It's simple, right? The plan of salvation that we all call the Romans road. We're going to talk a little bit more about that later. It's, it's simple. And therefore, it's something that every Christian, yea, and every church ought to have proper fellowship in. And, and we have experienced this ourselves. When a, when a church, hey, we may not agree on every doctrine that they teach. We may not agree that on everything that they do. We may not agree in their programs. We may not agree. There may be a lot of things that we disagree with in, a, in and amongst ourselves. But if they have the pure and true gospel, and they're taking it actively to the lost, we have fellowship. We're like, amen, that's great. You're reaching people for Christ. Wonderful. That's, that's great. That's good and right fellowship to have. The next is uh, Philippians chapter 2. Turn one page over. Maybe. Mine's right across the page. Philippians chapter 2, in verse 1, the Bible says, If there be therefore any consolation of Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any bowels of mercy... Fulfilling my joy that ye be like-minded, having the same love, being one of one accord, of one mind. The fellowship here we're talking about is the fellowship of the Spirit. Well, how do we have fellowship with the Spirit? First of all, we are born again. We are saved by the Spirit. Amen? If you're not saved by the Spirit, how can you have fellowship with the Spirit? And the best thing about having fellowship with the Spirit is it automatically puts us all in one accord. Why? We're, de we're all indwelt by the same God. We're all indwelt by the same Spirit of God. We're all indwelt by the same Spirit of God that spends its time in nothing more but to promote Christ, but to uplift Christ, not speaking of himself, but whatever words Christ taught within his Bible, he's going to bring to remembrance. If we all had the scriptures written on our hearts and we were all living them out, there'd be nothing but one accordness, if that's a word. There'd be nothing but the same mind happening. The Bible continues here in verse 3, it says, let nothing be done with strife or vainglory, and that goes to the wayside when we're all in the same spiritual mindset, or when we're fellowshipping with the Spirit, right? But in lowliness of mind, let each esteem other better than themselves. Another attribute of the Holy Spirit is that we're no longer going to care about ourselves because the Spirit himself does nothing but bear witness of another, bear witness of Christ, bear witness of the Word of God and how it can be used. So therefore, if we are all fellowshipping with the Spirit, there is no reason why we would be at strife. There is no reason why we would be seeking our own glory. We would esteem other better than ourselves. So look not every man, verse 4, look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. Wow. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal of God, but made himself, look at that, don't miss it, made himself of no reputation. How often do we treat, seek to make ourselves our reputation? It's wicked. It's not, you're not at fellowship with the Spirit of God if you're trying to make something of yourself, if you're trying to lift yourselves up. Be humble and allow him to lift you up. 
made himself, this is our Lord, this is our Savior, of no reputation, took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men, and being found in fashion of a man, he humbled himself, as if being made a man didn't humble him enough, right? He's found in the fashion of a man, he humbled himself even still, and became obedient unto, the, unto death, even unto the death of the cross. He humbled himself to become man, then humbled himself as a man, in order that he would die the death that would eventually set us all free. Yeah, the works are finished from the foundation of the world, but thanks be to God that he came and lived the life as an example and did everything that he needed to do in order to set me free, including Amen. the death, Amen. including the burial, including the resurrection, but the works that he completed while he's on this earth. Glory to God. He did those. Amen. It's, it's wonderful. And the right fellowship is to have that fellowship with the Spirit. And what does that give you? It gives you, it says in verse 2, like-minded. Be like-minded. Same love. One accord. One mind. That's what we're to have as Christians in amongst ourselves. Honestly, the only way, because I have an opinion, and Rob has an opinion, and Eric has an opinion, brother, can be... We all have separate opinions about different things. And if we got into a room, eventually we might even get into fisticuffs because of our disagreements. But if we're all led of the Spirit, if we have fellowship with the Spirit, there is no room for us to be at discord. There is no room for us to have strife or vainglory. Why? Because we have the like mind. What is that like mind? Verse 5. Let this mind be in you, which is also in Christ. Humility. Humble servitude. Giving of yourselves. That's the right mind. It only comes through the right fellowship, which is with the Holy Spirit of God. Amen. Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts in your New Testament. Acts chapter 2 and verse 41. We're looking at the right fellowship. Acts 2 verse 41. Then they that gladly received his word were baptized. Look at the order there. They gladly received his word and they were baptized. And the same day were added unto them about 3,000 souls. And they, being those that were saved and baptized, they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and in fellowship and in breaking of bread and in prayers. Amazing. The people that were saved followed the Lord in obedience immediately and were baptized. That same day, they were added to the church and they continued. And they continued and they continued and they went forth. And they didn't waver from what? The apostles' doctrine and fellowship and in breaking of bread and in prayers. Again, the only way that that happens is with the right kind of fellowship. And that is with the Holy Spirit. That is with God himself bringing to remembrance the word which Christ had spoken. And down in verse 46, it says that they continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house with gladness and singleness of heart. And we don't break bread here because most of us are keto, but you know what that means. It means to eat together, be fellowship one with another, enjoy company one with another, pray for one another. I was so overjoyed to hear of doctrine being talked about in, in, in the, the front lobby, I guess you'd call it. It's amazing when like-minded people filled with the Holy Spirit of God, there's only one, come together because they find it very quickly, singleness of heart, gladness. One accord, they are continuing in the doctrine. They're continually in fellowship, breaking of bread, and prayers. That's the right kind of fellowship, and that's what we all need to seek after. So we've talked about the wrong fellowship, we've talked about the right fellowship, now we're going to talk about the righteous fellowship. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Righteous fellowship is this. 1 Corinthians 1, chapter, or verse 4. I thank my God always, I thank my God always on your behalf for the grace of God which is given you by Jesus Christ. That in everything ye are enriched by him, in all utterance and in all knowledge, even as the testimony of Christ was confirmed in you, so that ye, be, ye come behind in no gift, waiting for the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ who shall also confirm you unto the end, that ye may be blameless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is faithful, by whom ye were called unto the fellowship of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Now I beseech you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that ye all speak the same thing, that there are no divisions among you, 
but that ye be perfectly joined together in the same mind and the same judgment. This is just reiterating what we just heard in regard to the Holy Spirit. But now he's talking about the fellowship of his son, the fellowship of the son, Jesus Christ. And look what that righteous relationship, that righteous fellowship with Christ himself brings. It brings, again, the same things as that righteous relationship with the Holy Spirit. And why should we think it to be any different? They're all God, right? And we become perfectly joined together, that same mind, that same judgment, speaking the same thing, speaking the same doctrines without division, without offense. The Bible continues that, how, explain how. How does, this, how does this right relationship with Christ come to pass? Turn with me to 1 John near the end of your Bible. 1 John. If anything, that last text is just a proof text of what we've already been talking about. I love how the Bible works that way. Now, with the two or three witnesses, every word shall be established. 1 John chapter 1. How do we have the righteous fellowship? 1 John chapter 1. Starting in verse 3. That which we have seen and heard declare we unto you, that ye also may have fellowship with us. And truly our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. And these things write we unto you, that your joy may be full. This then is the message which we have heard of him and declare unto you, that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. Watch this. If we say we have fellowship with him, in other words, if we say we have fellowship with the God who is light and has no darkness in him at all, if we say we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ his Son cleanseth us from all sin. He just took the context from fellowship amongst ourselves to fellowship with Christ, with the Father, and with His Son, and then He brought it down to, to a practical application where He says, if we say we have fellowship with Him and walk in darkness, we lie. In other words, we are being hypocrites. But if we walk in the light as He is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. This is talking about Christ Himself. This is talking about the relationship among His people. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanseth us from all sin. Verse 6 isn't saying that if we're saying we have fellowship but do any darkness. It's talking about if we are walking in darkness, seeking in darkness, pursuing darkness. Then what's missing? Your salvation? Have you lost it? No. You have lost fellowship. You have lost the camaraderie. You have lost the yoke of Christ upon you. And there's nothing wrong with that. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, right? Don't let an unbeliever put a yoke on you, but praise be to God if he would put his yoke upon you. It's easy. His burden is light. But if we are to seek after darkness and not seek the truth, not walk in the light, the only thing that is broken is our fellowship. But look, it doesn't say you've got to walk in sinless perfection. It says walk in the light as he is in the light. We have fellowship one with another. And here's the key. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. If we are walking in light, if we are seeking him, if we have fellowship with him because our intents and our motives are to please God or to love God or to be with God or to keep his commandments, the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanseth us from all sins. That's going to close out any of the gaps in your walk. Because we all sin. This is what the same chapter said the same thing. If you say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. The truth of the scriptures and the truth of our reality that we're presently living is we all sin. But glory be to God. Praise his name that if we are walking in the light, there's that fellowship. If we're seeking to, to walk with him and to learn of him and to love him, there's that fellowship. And the blood of Jesus Christ closes the gap where you mess up, where you sin, where you say the wrong thing, where you have the wrong thought, where you allow yourselves by yielding to the flesh to sin, if you're walking in the light, hey, God will close even that gap. He'll bring to remembrance, Josh, that was wrong. And you'll say, yeah, I know. Forgive me, Lord. The blood of Jesus Christ is there waiting for you. Cleanse you from all sin. That is the righteous fellowship. Now, notice the righteous fellowship where we're living in the light produces fellowship with him. We just saw that. It also produces fellowship among us. And, and just by simple nature of light itself, it automatically opposes the darkness. So if we are walking in light with Christ step by step, moment by moment, each day that passes, the light cannot be present. 
right? Or the darkness cannot be present, right? We know that when you turn on a light, the darkness leaves, right? And, and that's, that's the plain and simple truth. So the right fellowship is one where we do not forsake the assembly, one with ourselves. The righteous fellowship is where we seek to walk in the light with Christ. And if we are doing those things actively and with, with, a, with the right heart, with the right mentality, and with a love in our hearts, one for another and for Christ himself, automatically there's just no time to have fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness. Rather, a reproof will be all that comes from our mouths, right? We have love for Christ. We have love for the brethren. And that becomes um, a fullness. That becomes our faithfulness in fellowship. Amen. Thank you, Father, for this day and for this opportunity that we've had. Uh, I pray, God, for the rest of the service that you would just be with it. You would bless us. Um, just open up our eyes and give us understanding of your scriptures. And we thank you for it each step of the way. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. 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 Amen.